Dudley loved music as much as any human being could love music. Dudley was no musical joke. He was a, a really a musician who could have earned his living brilliantly in the musical profession. He was the funniest and the saddest man I'd ever met. No, it's not a curable condition. It is a degenerative condition. Um, the speed at which it degenerates is, is somewhat variable, but it is always irreversible. This is the story of a man who loves music, a love that has been the one constant in a turbulent life. This westerly coastline of Nova Scotia is where Dudley Moore comes to spend his summers, staying with two musician friends. Back home in New Jersey the rest of the year, Rena Fruchter and Brian Dallow are his neighbors and his unpaid carers. Because for the last few years, Dudley has been suffering from a rare degenerative illness that affects his speech, movement, balance, everything except his mental alertness. These days, most of the comedy is gone from Dudley's life, but the music very much remains. And of all his many talents, it's his music that he wanted to help us celebrate. Dudley Moore is to me, now, a man who's got um, wonderful musical taste, which is expressed in not only his performance, but also in his composition, a wonderful jazz pianist. If you're thinking of the piano tree, I mean, I discovered Dudley Moore on Not Only But Also as, as this clown, this maniac leaping about. And then suddenly, um, out of nowhere, we come this wonderful jazz trio. And he's sitting there playing wonderful jazz. Didn't he have a piece that was all endings? Was that him? It was, <laughs> I heard him do that once. Maybe it was in a house somewhere at a party. But he sat down and played a piece that was only endings. And it was hilariously funny. So uh, he, was, he was good to have around at the piano. The thing about talking music with Dudley is that there are so many different types to range over. In fact, there's almost no form of music that he hasn't at some time produced. Optimism that we wanted to put in there. And of course, uh, think again, Dudley was a classical scholar. We discovered in our, in our researches for this film that he wrote a string quartet. He wrote a string quartet? In 1958. What do you know, Magdalen College, 1958? Oh, that's wonderful. Has he heard this? Never. Never or not since then? Well, we don't think it's ever been played. Oh, well, you've got to get it played for him. That, he, he would be so pleased. I mean, that would be like finding an, an, a forgotten child, you know? That's wonderful. Wrote it in two weeks for his finals, always works right up to the wire. And um, so we went digging, and uh, a few days later we got a phone call to say, we found the string quartet in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Dudley, we have something here which oh. I think, I'm pretty sure you haven't seen in a long time. Take, oh, a, no. take a look at that. God, yes. <laughs> I remember this. Uh, Work with uh, some affection, some, some affection. It's written with, with uh, a certain kind of expertise and knowledge. And you can usually tell by that somebody's handwriting, whether he is uh, whether he's familiar with what he's doing or not, because not lots of people have a handwriting when they write a score, which is they make little circles and fill them in. Those are suspect. But uh, this is a man who wrote quickly in, knowing what he wants. I'd love to hear that. I thought that phrase... Mm, we found it phrase. in the Bodleian Library, anyway. Mm. It's quite demanding, though, to be played, isn't it? It's pretty yes, hard, yes, I think. Yes, it's, it's, it doesn't seem mm. simple. Mm. <laughs> 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 mm. Thank you. 
The unlikely beginnings of a story that's often been glamorous took place here, on the Beckentree Estate in Dagenham, at number 14, Monmouth Road. They brought a piano, and I think Barbara, whose sister, was the one who was going to have lessons. And um, his Dudley was the one who suddenly showed this enormous ability. And um, I think Barbara just played, but I mean, Dudley, it was just like coming home, I suppose. were a bit reclusive. His mother built up a sort of fortress in her house. We, we, I was allowed in there if Dudley was there and I was allowed in occasionally to, to hear him play the piano, well, quite often really in the front room, but we were, it wasn't always encouraged. I think Dudley found that a bit embarrassing. Ada Moore was a woman of complicated temperament. Those of Dudley's friends that knew her at all were wary of her. She could be very amusing, very jolly, very intense and she could turn and reject you in a moment. She undoubtedly loved her son, but he'd been born with physical imperfections that caused her guilt. The boy had a club foot, a withered leg, and remained short in stature. It wasn't ideal equipment to take into the school life of 50 years ago. Predictably, Dudley was in danger of being victimised. Yes, I've heard about it. I mean, there were stories that, that he was bullied, but I guess the minute you offer Dudley the chance either to perform on the piano or um, as a comedian, I, I think bullying goes uh, out of the window because the bullies can't handle talent. good at everything. His sight reading, which was, of course was always amazing. I mean, Dudley could sit down, I, I could put in front of him, say, a, a six-part Bach fugue, which I couldn't play, but Dudley would sit down and play it. The thing about his sight reading, a lot of people could sight read relatively well, but he could actually sight read and at the same time, um, you know, make the thing meaningful, probably first time through. I think that, that, that was astonishing. The first time I actually met him was in this hall, and I was standing at the back he was playing uh, for his school, the accompaniment to Handel's Messiah. And I looked at him, he was a tiny little guy, he didn't appear to have very big hands, but the way he got around these big chords on the, uh, on the score it really impressed me. 
and at the time I was into Garner, into Art Tatum, into Oscar Peterson, I really was into jazz. And when he'd finished playing the Handel's Messiah and everyone was relaxing and tea was being handed around, he suddenly broke into a piece of Garner, which was such a clever mimicry that he even put the groans in and I was absolutely sold. I knew then I was in the presence of a great musician. The Errol Garner piano style has been a lifelong influence on Dudley's playing. The two of them had size in common too. The grunting Garner was so small, he often sat on a telephone directory to play. This basis for a jazz style was already laid when Dudley's career in more formal music took a great leap forward. Against national competition, he won the McKinnon Organ Scholarship to Magdalen College, Oxford. Just to go to university in those days was quite something, but to actually get into Oxford was almost unbelievable. And I think I understand that his mother actually, when that letter came through, she ran out into the street saying, "My son's got to university. My son's got to university." And that uh, it was a, a staggering moment. Oxford in the 50s wasn't overrun with lads from suburban Essex, and yet Dudley managed to thrive. I think he was pretty exceptional. People recognised it. I think one of his um, lectures at Oxford actually was, says that he was the only genius he taught from 1930 on, and the whole time he was there. And I, I would I would use the word genius because he was really quite outstanding um, musician, but he worked at it as well. The first time I met Dudley was in Magdalen College Chapel. It was amusing, even at that time, that quite a few of the choir boys were considerably taller than Dudley, even though their voices hadn't broken as yet. At Oxford, people tend to be six foot tall, and the sons of gentlemen, and they would be. And Dudley was there, what, five foot two, and he must have felt, until he could actually reach the stage or the piano, no one would notice him. But the moment he reached the piano and the stage, everyone noticed him. There is a slight knack of being in the right place at the right time. And uh, although I don't have any talent myself, uh, you know, I can organise a 16-piece band and I do meet up with people and bring them together and it sort of works. And John Bassett did organise a 16-piece band, the Bassett Hounds, soon featuring Dudley Moore piano. It was just at the time of the last of the big bands and um, we played the Dorchester and the, all the big hotels. And I think Dudley was totally astonished to find the command he had over the audience. Because people stopped dancing, because he started clowning, because he started putting on a cabaret show in the middle of every item that we were playing. Well, I started fooling around at school, really, when I was about 15. Uh, I wasn't very popular at school when I was young, being a very serious boy and very hard working. And it wasn't so much a desire to become popular uh, as a desire to be less unpopular that made me uh, start falling around. And I found that I could make people laugh and, and I started to cash in on this. Life had settled into a sort of pattern where Dudley played jazz by night and a variety of other musics by day. It was easy to fill the timetable, but not to predict what might come next. Oxford could have claimed him permanently when he was offered the post of organist and choir master at Queen's College. You were offered that job, I mean, the old organist post and everything. Yes. It was a very prestigious thing. How close did you come to accepting that? I was so close by it. Of course, but um, I didn't. I didn't uh, think that it was uh, good for me. To yeah, for teaching, I suppose. Yeah. You, are you a good teacher? Are you? No, I'm not. No. I'm not. Did you have any idea what career you wanted to do? No, I didn't have any idea at all. Um, I thought uh, it would be nice to do some composition. The 
gala opening of a new venue for jazz and musical theatre at Wavenden. This is the domain of Dame Cleo Lane and John Dankworth. It was they who, in a chance meeting more than 40 years ago, opened up another new musical life for Dudley. Yes, we were playing with our big band at uh, May Ball, and um, we went to, to breakfast afterwards, Cleo and I, and um, we saw this little upright piano on the stage of the hall we were in, and um, it's the, the back of the piano was towards us. We couldn't see who was playing it, but we could hear, and it sounded really great. You know, it was a very special way of playing the piano. And so we peeped round the corner, and there was this uh, diminutive uh, gentleman playing. And so we listened for a while, and it was quite enchanting. Do you remember that May Ball? Was it the Maudlin May Ball where you were playing? And yes, they heard the you. Maudlin May Ball. And uh, I was playing. My organ stuff, and uh, they they were stuck with it. It was uh, a magical moment. Yeah. He was playing away, and when we f when he finished, we applauded. And then he got into conversation and said he was coming down any any moment. And uh, had we got any jobs for pianists? So he eventually landed up in my band for um, about. Um, I guess best part of a year he was with us. He had a little extra something. I mean, he wasn't just a pianist, but when he was on stage, he was not only a wonderful jazz player, but he was a, a marvelous sense of humor as well. And he was hilarious. He, he brought the house down. He was a very, very funny man. I should think it's quite natural because to be a good comedian, you need to have great timing. And obviously, his jazz probably helped the timing, or his natural timing helped the comedy and the jazz. Oh, he could play anything, all the standards, plenty of blues. And, and improvisation, which was uh, like jazz should be, like talking to you. Right. He really could swing with the best of them, Dudley, no doubt about that. He was fantastic to play with, you know. And a great trio pianist. I mean, a lot of piano players, as you know, they, they, they play a nice solo and they accompany well. But when it comes to a trio setting, you know, they don't really have it together. But Dudley was really a great trio pianist, no doubt about it. He announced to us that he'd been getting together with a couple of school chums, <laughs> so to speak, and got a review going. And could he have, he said, could I have about three weeks off because of Edinburgh? So I said, well, Dudley, you can have three weeks off, but I don't believe you'll ever come back. And um, you have our blessing. Beyond the Fringe, with the original cast of Alan Bennett, Peter Cook, Jonathan Miller, and Dudley Moore. I thought he was wonderful because he did that parody of Benjamin Britten, which is anybody like you who knows about music, he does the, the most vicious parody of Benjamin Britten I have ever heard, and he does a wonderful Peter Pierce impression. Bennett and Jonathan, these tremendous academics uh, who really are in a different league entirely. Then you've got Peter Cook, who is this fanatically hard-working, obsessive, but as we now know, alcoholic and depressive. And then you've got Dud. And Dud is always the outsider. Dud's the only one in the fringe who plays the piano. He, uh, but they sort of make fun of him all through the show. And he's still, wherever he goes, he's the outsider. Between shows, all manner of music making was taking place, various enough to attract the attention of a BBC arts programme. Moore turns out pop songs, commercials for soap or a quartet for strings with equal facility, and improvisation is the starting point for almost everything he does. He publishes very little and generally works on commission, 
writing background music for films and incidental music for theatres like the Royal Court in London. <laughs> doing is um, giving me the melody to a piece he wrote uh, quite some while ago that we can't find any trace of the manuscript unfortunately and it's an important piece because it was quite early in Dudley's career and it's a piece called Sergeant Musgrave's Dance and we very much like the theme of it now if I don't have a recording of it and we've tried museums and theatres to try and get hold of, of some manuscript for it, it doesn't exist so therefore the only way I can recreate it is by asking Dudley to remember what he wrote which he's kindly doing now on the piano and giving it me note by note so I can, in my rough script, write it down and then and remember it, try to remember it as well and then we can uh, have it played for the film. Oh, I see, it goes... Does it go to the D? Every time you play it, there's some more in there. Yeah. Make a row at the end. It's a bit, it, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit, bit down there. Yeah. When it was done originally, I asked Dudley this, and he said it was a portable organ. Right. Now, what would a portable organ have sounded like in 1960? Do you think a sort of a, a simple sort of trouble is there's an oscillation there? Hear it? Brian D. playing organ on this session happens also to have been a pianist colleague of Dudley's at the old establishment club in Soho. This was a space dedicated by Peter Cook and others to the pursuit of satire and a rollicking good time. You go first, you're bigger than me. Still recognisable from the street, the place has changed a bit inside, but Brian could still find his way around among the shadows and ghosts of the past. Yeah, Frankie Howard uh, worked here. Um, there was a resident company I used to play up here with the trio and accompany the show and also we played downstairs and that was where Dudley uh, played as well with his trio. But he was a very fine player. Great player, Dudley. Yeah. Very swinging piano player. Yeah. Should we take a look downstairs? Absolutely. Maybe? If we can find where you used to be, but of course it will have changed. The original stairs were through here, actually. You came out of the bar there, and you came down these steps. These looked like uh, the originals. Pretty steep, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> so this was a jazz cellar in the old-fashioned right. sense. It really was. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Slightly different. Not a performing area, um, except for the cook. This evening we have taken our not only but also cameras to the heart of London's West End, where at a nightclub, La Maison Sophistiquée, we see the opening of the great coloured jazz singer, Bo Dudley. <laughs> Very, very good. And when you look at the series with Peter Cook, uh, not only but also, a lot of that is done. You have been described as the greatest coloured jazz singer. Um, what, what particular colour are you? <laughs> sort of a fleshy pink, fleshy little pink. red on the cheeks, 
purple in the middle of the eye, blue around the chin. Yes. You'd relate to probably Peter Cook to someone like Danny Kaye, but nobody had to work with Danny Kaye. Danny Kaye just went off alone. Dudley had to constantly work with this absolutely unrestrained, very undisciplined, very shambolic talent. I was just about to drop off and suddenly tap, tap, tap at the bloody window pane. <laughs> I looked out, you know who it was, who? Bloody Greta Garbo. <laughs> Bloody Greta Garbo. I don't believe he's ever had the credit for what he did for Peter Cook, for Beyond the Fringe, for, for jazz, if you like, uh, for movies. And I think in a funny way, he still feels that he was kind of neglected by, by everybody, really, uh, that he was just the wrong, the wrong guy in, in the wrong place. There were more strains in the partnership of Cook and Moore than we knew of at the time. So, to the regret of the TV audience, the pairing was dissolved. For Dudley, the parting of the ways involved a radical move, a new culture and eventually a new scope for his music. The lure of fame, applause, Hollywood, the girls, the fun. I mean, who, who could resist it? No one. A guy from Dagenham becoming a Hollywood star, it's, it's, it's nearly unbelievable. Dudley had made films in England, but if you're going to take on Hollywood, you do need an agent. I think he wanted to find uh, an acceptance in American audiences to be separated from Peter. He had made a major commitment, you know, to come over to the United States and live, uh, and he wanted a career that was his own. Already an established agent when he met Dudley, Lou Pitt was left in no doubt what his new client had come for. Right. Music was not a part of it, you know, certainly at that time. Uh, he wanted to record uh, things, you know, maybe with Peter. I think they had another album or two to do. Uh, and, uh, but he wanted movies. He definitely wanted movies. He wanted to be a movie star. I think that Dud's whole story is that of the outsider. He gets to Hollywood, he has this extraordinary success with a movie called Ten, and he suddenly becomes a great star, only because, in fact, another actor had turned the job down. George Siegel was meant to do Ten and pulled out at the last minute, and they were searching around, and they got Dud. I got a call on this second week or third week of shooting from, from Tony Adams and said, uh, you're not going to believe this, you know, but you now have a sex star on your hands. I said, what are you talking about? I said, you now have a leading man who is going to be a sex star. And wait till you see what he's doing on this film. You know, of course he was right. The success of Ten, reinforced later by Arthur, made Dudley an international star. But music was still an ever-present companion in the obligatory California beach house, at Hollywood parties, on the film sets, where directors supplied a piano for him to play between takes. In fact, music was an appetite that needed constant refreshment. So Dudley sought out the best of musical company, notably one of the greatest bassists of modern jazz, sometime husband of Ella Fitzgerald, Ray Brown. I got a call from him one day, and he said that he had been doing a lot of movies and he wanted to play some music. And I said, well, <clears throat> I said, you know, I got a pretty heavy schedule myself, but uh, why don't we get together and talk and see? So he had a house at the beach and I went out to see him. And I saw all these scores on the piano and I saw all of this stuff and I said, what, what's all that stuff? He said, oh, I'm transcribing some Oscar Peterson solos. Oh, yeah? You ought to see what that looks like. If you think symphony scores look tough, you ought to see some Oscar Peterson. As a member of one of the Peterson trios, Ray Brown knew what Oscar's playing involved. It wasn't long before Ray and Dudley were sharing concert stages together. Big stages, too. We did all kinds of stuff. You know, he did... Uh, when we worked at the Bowl, we, we did the Porgy and Bess Overture with the symphony, you know? And then we did... Uh, the other stuff with a trio. So he was, you know, he could do everything. He didn't have problems there. I, I just, I tried to get him to do more, you know? 
but I think he was being pulled at in a lot of directions, you know. Sometimes Dudley was willing to be pulled, as in the case of a new movie he was offered. It was a dramatic role in a, in a melodramatic film with, you know, a very serious underlying subject, that death of a child. And I thought, you know, uh, great to have somebody with a sense of humor. I mean, I, I don't want to suffer through this movie, and I don't want the characters to suffer through it. So I, I thought that was a, a challenging idea for, for Dudley to play that kind of part. And Tony Bill, who still directs in Hollywood, was about to give his leading man the chance to write a score which Dudley has always named as his favorite film composition. Knowing Dudley's music and, and, knowing, and getting to know Dudley on the shooting of the movie, wherever there was a piano present, Dudley would sit down and play it. And very early on into shooting, I said, let's not wait for the location to provide the piano, let's have a piano on the set. So I had a piano on the set every day. Trash, isn't it? The F minor one? Yes. Yeah, I don't know it. No, okay. One day he was playing around on the set. He started to improvise something. And I said, Dudley, what, what is that? He said, nothing. I'm just making it up right now. I said, that would be a great theme. I love that theme, what you're doing. And that became the theme for our movie. I suppose it was a very... Um, oversimplified theme, which I, I latched onto, but, uh, um, I disguised it with some alacrity. I think it's a magnificent piece, and it's the best one of his I've ever heard. I think it was, uh, um, a combination of my feeling it and uh, playing it. Um, it came from just playing. I find it very satisfactory. funniest and the saddest man I'd ever met. Elsa Blankstead was the music editor on Six Weeks. She became a friend and a concerned observer of Dudley's life with all its apparent ease and its inner difficulties. But he did a magnificent job. It is, the music is so good and again, so sad. I think that's the place that he always went to when he uh, when he wrote material, when he wrote, you know, uh, serious music, uh, he went deep inside himself. But he speaks to you then. And we loved it. We finally got ready to record, and he didn't want a conductor, he wanted to conduct. It seems now like some sort of terrible prediction that Dudley should have invested so much of himself in a story about incurable illness. But those closest to the movie felt no foreboding, only gratitude. It was a celebration. And we all loved it. We all loved the score. The problem was nobody went to see the movie because a little girl dies. The film came out and just went belly up. It just, you know, got decimated. And it was, it went from the happiest experience of his life to, to the most, one of the most, if not the most disappointing parts of his, of his life. And, and why they didn't embrace it and why they didn't like it. They didn't like uh, the sentimentality of it and the fact that a girl died of Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Too, too openly yeah. emotional for them, wasn't Yes, it, yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, I got some fairly heavy flack from that. He was... It, it depressed him, you know, a lot. Well, it felt awful. I felt sure that uh, the music would get by without any problem, but uh, it wasn't the case. I think it was very hard for him to write the score. It was really work. 
which nobody appreciates. Dudley's peak career was only really about four or five years and maybe half a dozen films. And then he goes into this terrible kind of decline. He starts to get ill. Typically in California, they think he's drinking, which he wasn't. And they fire him from, I think, a Barbara Streisand movie in which he had a few lines. And they also know he's, and, and I knew he wasn't drinking because Dud does not drink like that. And this was the beginning, of course, of the illness, which we all now know has really crippled him. But he does remain, I think, even, you know, apart from the, this terrible illness, an outsider. He never really looks in, a few times I've seen him in Hollywood, he never really looked at home there or in New York. He was always the boy from the other side of the tracks. The commercial failure of Six Weeks and the virtual disappearance of its music hit Dudley hard. It made him much more apprehensive about the film offers he was getting. But whenever he turned away from the acting world, he found music still waiting to receive him once more. A world of consolation. Robert Mann, a friend for 40 years, recently retired from his chair as first violin with the Juilliard String Quartet. Dudley loved music as much as any human being could love music. And you know, it's an interesting thing because he never practiced like a, a concert pianist. You know, they develop muscles below their muscles to be able to have lots of weight. He didn't have that kind of weight in his piano playing, but in terms of fleetness and intellectual understanding of the music, he was, he was one of the best. It is rare for comedianship and high art to come in the same package, but knowing that Dudley was such a rarity, Robert Mann propelled him towards the concert platform. I mean, he insisted on an English composer, so we played Delius, uh, but we played Bach, we played M Mozart. We, it was a fabulously successful program. Yeah, yeah. But, but we sort of forced him because he was reluctant. He, he didn't feel, he didn't really feel that he should do it. Well, you know. But he's very persuasive. Dudley <laughs> has always been, in a sense, uh, tortured by a kind of self-doubt. And uh, starting from, you know, how he was treated he's when he was born. And how he, and the fact that he wasn't a tall, debonair, you know, classical uh, star. And so, uh, he always had, in a sense, he needed support from other people, and then when he would lose himself, then, then he, was, he was perfect. The critics' confidence in Dudley grew to match his own, and his concerts with Robert Mann were warmly received. And then he began playing with quite a few orchestras. I know Jerry had him with the Seattle Symphony. And uh, then he began to playing duo concerts with Rena Fruchter. So he really built a kind of career out of that. But he was still, of course, multi-talented. Rena Fruchter had been a child prodigy of the keyboard. Dudley met her when she was a New York Times reviewer. He hesitated at first over the notion of a musical alliance. Once we started playing together, it did fall into place very well. And it was, um, he was actually the slave driver. He's, he would spend four, five, six hours rehearsing. He liked a challenge musically. He liked um, music that was difficult, music that made a big statement, and music, music that was very emotional. It was when they toured Australia, and certain performances went slightly awry, that the first signs of a physical problem showed themselves. He was having a little trouble with one finger, and he was tired, and he was trying very hard, and some of the performances were really good, and some um, had problems, and he was very, very upset about this 
finger. And that's, that's really, I think, where it began. The first thing he talked about was playing the piano. He said uh, that it was a subtle thing, but that when he was playing the lowest notes with his little finger, that it would tend to either freeze up or repeat itself in ways that he didn't want it to. So it was clear that there was a motor problem going on. I think people misinterpreted. They thought he w was drunk, and he wasn't, because he, the, the condition started to manifest itself by Dudley falling and slurring his speech a little bit. But it was obvious on meeting him that you would, you would make that connection. Uh, his speech was very slurred. And unfortunately, it sounded very much like his drunk imitations that he had done in the movies. I think once a title or a name was put on the disease, I think that was at least some consolation. Um, at least he was able to say, now I've got PSP. Progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, is also known as Steele Richardson Olszewski syndrome uh, after the three physicians who first identified it. And it's a degenerative condition of the nervous system in which nerve cells slowly die out, very much the same as in Alzheimer's disease. And then I think the realization of what that implied was somewhat devastating to him. So it makes one slow, makes one very rigid, it severely limits eye movements, and it causes speech to become slurred and eventually unintelligible it's affected him very deeply, and I think he has developed a certain kind of, um, uh, there's a certain depression in that, a certain feeling that, um, you know, life is not really going to go very much further forward, and I think that's very difficult for him to take. It was his world. It was how he first got people to pay attention to him. Yes, my foot drags. Yes, I'm little, but I can make you laugh and I can make you listen. And he found, if not the world he really wanted, he found a world. He found applause. And as good as it is when you get it, it's terrible when it stops. It's a kind of death. He misses it. I know he misses it. pleasure to the world and at this stage in his life um, needs something which is really more which is really a very personal need he needs a, he needs family he needs support he needs the kind of environment I think that hopefully we're able to offer him to some degree with the family environment that he really now is part of in a way he's in a place that he's comfortable with and he is able to be himself and since music is what's at the heart of Dudley, that hasn't changed. Dudley Moore and music are still together. His latest project was to collaborate on the orchestration of a piano piece called Showbiz, a subject on which his musical thoughts are rueful.
I feel uh, angry. That's true. Um, to be reduced to this, this mm, insignificant version of myself. That's it. It's um, overpowering. Love it.